House should not have confidence in the Minister for Human Services. The Minister for Human Services knowingly, deliberately, wantonly lied to Parliament on the last sitting day of the last sitting week. He was asked a direct question by the Greens whether or not he was part of a cabinet or government decision to uh, change the Residential Tenancy Act of 1997 to remove the genuine or just provisions, Madam Speaker, to make it easier to evict tenants. Now, we know, Madam Speaker, that Mr Yench was right in the thick of this decision because it came about as a result of a full bench of the Supreme Court decision last July, I believe it was, Madam Speaker, in favour of uh, Mr Gregory Parsons, a 55-year-old disability pensioner who'd been living in his Glenorchy flat for 10 years, Madam Speaker, who Housing Tasmania sought to evict. And thankfully, because of the hard work and the dedication and commitment to at-risk Tasmanians of the Tenants' Union of Tasmania, the case was found in favour of Mr Parsons. And then, in estimates last year, off the back of that full court, full bench of the Supreme Court decision, Madam Speaker, uh, Dr Woodruff, my excellent colleague and friend, had asked uh, Minister Yench uh, what the government's response would be to the full bench of the Supreme Court decision. And she said uh, at the back end of the question, what are you intending to do with those tenants, housing Tasmania tenants who've been evicted into homelessness, who are not provided with reasons for their eviction or an opportunity to have their decision reviewed? The Minister says, Housing Tasmania will take time now to consider the various implications of yesterday's court decision. A little later in the questioning, I can confirm that Housing Tasmania will consider the implications and a number of times uh, during that exchange at the estimates table uh, when Dr Woodruff doggedly uh, questioned the Minister on behalf of Housing Tasmania tenants, he said he is waiting for Housing Tasmania's advice. Uh, and this was the estimates transcript of the 5th of June last year where he said, in another answer, we will be considering that matter and how it was dealt with in that case and what its implications are for the future, and I will wait for Housing Tasmania's advice. So that, Madam Speaker, was June last year, Madam Deputy Speaker, where the Minister responsible for the lives and well-being of Housing Tasmania tenants said he was awaiting Housing Tasmania's advice on how to respond to the Parsons matter, Madam Speaker. That's why we asked him the question, Madam Speaker, because the only reason government would make a decision to remove the genuine or just provisions, Madam Speaker, is to make it easier for Housing Tasmania to move on tenants, Madam Speaker. The decision that Cabinet did make and later reversed on the 24th of August was a direct response to the Supreme Court decision, which found against Housing Tasmania and therefore against the Tasmanian government. This raises quite significant and substantive questions about what advice Housing Tasmania did give to Minister Yedge in response to the full bench of the Supreme Court decision. What is certain, Madam Deputy Speaker, is that Minister Yench knew that a decision had been made to amend the Residential Tenancy Act of 1997 to weaken the protections for tenants. And because of this Cabinet decision, Madam Speaker, that I hold here, uh, that was made on the 24th of August, we know that the decision to reverse the previous decision to remove the genuine or just provisions was made five months after we went into a pandemic emergency. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, for five months, it was government policy to make it easier to evict tenants, Madam Speaker. I seek the leave of the House to table this Cabinet decision. I have given a copy to the Labor Party, I have given a copy to Ms Ogilvy, and we know that government has a copy, Madam Speaker. Well, the question is that leave be granted. 
Uh, Madam Speaker, for the reasons that have been articulated in a letter from the Premier to Ms O'Connor, the government won't be supporting further distribution of the letter, regardless of the fact that Ms O'Connor has been circulating it far and wide already, um, and uh, uh, documents brought before the House ordinarily attach privilege, uh, which is in special circumstances when a document is not already public. So for the reasons that we're not prepared to support any further stunts, uh, we won't be agreeing to this particular motion. Well, Madam Deputy yeah, Speaker, yeah. what... Well, the question... Would now to yeah. yeah. Well, the question is that leave be granted those of that opinion say aye. 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 To the contrary, no. Aye. aye. The noes have it. Well, Madam Speaker, I'm not going to divide in the middle of my contribution because that's something the government would enjoy very much. But, Madam Deputy Speaker, it says an awful lot about this government's arrogance its contempt for transparency, that it won't allow to be tabled a document which verifies a minister's lie, Madam Speaker. And yes, we have distributed, Madam Speaker, not out of a gotcha moment, as the Liberals would have it, and not for some bloodlust for a minister's scalp, as Mr Ferguson said this morning. We've distributed, we've distributed it, Madam Speaker, Deputy Speaker, so that Tasmanians understand what this government would have done to uh, disadvantaged tenants in the middle of a housing and homelessness crisis. Because before the pandemic hit, Madam Deputy Speaker, we were uh, in the middle of uh, some of the harshest times uh, for Tasmanians who were looking for a home. We had 11,500 homes short of what is needed, Madam Deputy Speaker homelessness on the increase, Madam Deputy Speaker, and this government was going to change the law to make it easier to evict people into homelessness. That's why the Cabinet decision should be on the parliamentary record. But because Mr Ferguson is running cover for a lying minister, Madam Speaker, I will now read the Cabinet decision into Hansard. This is a decision that was made on the 24th of August 2020 under the Minister for Building and Construction, my colleague Ms Archer. The title is Residential Tenancy Amendment Bill 2020. And the document says, Cabinet today deliberated on the matter submitted to it in relation to the Residential Tenancy Amendment Bill 2020 and decided to, one, agree and approve drafting to finalise the Residential Tenancy Amendment Bill 2020, subject to the following amendments. A, introduction of provisions to provide for the enforcement of minimum standards by the Residential Tenancy Commissioner. B, amend provisions introduced due to COVID-19, which allow a tenant or landlord to apply to the Residential Tenancy Commissioner to break a lease if its continuation would cause severe hardship. And C, and here's the kicker for every one of the 13,000 Tasmanians who live in social housing, Madam Speaker, vacate the previous Cabinet decision in regard to the Director of Housing's v Parsons matter the Parsons matter, and not proceed with the proposed amendment to remove the genuine or just requirement in the context of an order for vacant possession. Now, Madam Speaker, the Cabinet decision goes on. So, despite what the Minister tells us, um, that he was not aware of any change that had been made or proposed, he was, Madam Speaker. It went to Cabinet, Madam Speaker. And because we know that this minister was waiting for advice from Housing Tasmania following the Supreme Court decision, we know that he was right in the thick of this decision, Madam Speaker. He would have been briefed on this decision before it was made. He was part of a conversation with the relevant minister, the Attorney General, the Minister for Building and Construction. Madam Speaker, and he was part of a whole of government decision to weaken tenancy protections. And yet when we asked him in this place, Madam Speaker, can you confirm in response to that judgment in the Parsons case that a decision was made by you and the government you are part of to change the Residential Tenancy Act to make it easier to evict tenants without genuine or just reason? The Minister, in the space of about five metres between his chair and the lectern, had decided not to tell the truth, Madam Deputy Speaker, because he got up and he stood up at this lectern and he said, 
I am not aware of any changes proposed or undertaken regarding making it more difficult. I do not know what decision Ms O'Connor might be referring to. Lie. Madam Speaker, a direct and obvious lie. He knew exactly what decision the Greens were referring to, Madam Speaker. He was part of that decision. And you know what? If we didn't have the Cabinet decision to confirm the lie, that lie would have stood on the public record, Madam Speaker. The Minister thought he'd get away with it because he didn't know we had a Cabinet document. Madam Speaker, that is so shameful, Madam Speaker, for a Minister of the Crown to knowingly lie in this place. A Minister who is responsible in policy and portfolio terms for some of our most disadvantaged people, Madam Speaker. And then when I interjected uh, on that question, I said, point of order, Madam Speaker, this is very important relevance. It's not about the pandemic response. It's about a decision made by government to change the law to make it easier to evict tenants. Mr Yench says, Madam Speaker, to change the law, the government needs to bring the law to the parliament and argue its case. We have not done that. I do not know what else Ms O'Connor is referring to. That's a lie, Madam Speaker. It is a clear and direct lie. Because remember, at this point, he didn't know we had the document. So he was prepared to double down on a lie. A Minister of the Crown. Madam Speaker. And then when I said, on the second question, your integrity is in question. You've misled the House. How do you explain yourself? Mr Yench goes, Madam Speaker, I thank the member for her question. I'd be happy to review the Cabinet record and the decision referred to and take further advice on the matter. To use a colloquialism, Madam Speaker, at that point of question time, I'm quite sure that Mr Yench was pooping himself because he knew he'd lied, Madam Speaker, and he'd been busted by a Cabinet decision. And then... Uh, when we sought leave to move a motion of no confidence in a very brief uh, contribution, Mr Yench goes, Madam Deputy Speaker, consistent with my previous response, in response to the question from the Leader of the Greens, my answer was correct. Lie, Madam Deputy Speaker, any decision by the government to change the law would need to be tabled in this place, and until it is tabled, no final decision has been made. Correct. We have been treated like idiots, Madam Speaker. Cabinet makes decisions about all range of matters. Some of them relate to legislation. Some of them relate to policy. Some will be for appointments. A decision is a decision is a decision, Madam Speaker. And the Cabinet handbook says a decision of Cabinet is government policy, Madam Speaker. There's no qualifier around that language in the Cabinet handbook. The Cabinet Handbook doesn't say a decision by Cabinet is not a decision until legislation hits the floor of Parliament. That's a distortion of the truth, Madam Speaker. It is Orwellian to try to make us believe that that is the case, Madam Speaker. And then, in an embarrassing exchange, as the Minister tried to run away from the TV cameras and the journalists the next day at the uh, Commissioner for Children and Young People's Ambassador event in Launceston. We got this from Mr Yetch. <coughs> Cassie asked a question without giving me very much context. I answered to the best of my ability. Well, apart from not being honest, if that answer was to the best of Mr Yench's ability, he is incompetent to be a Minister of the Crown, overseeing um, the lives and well-being of people, uh, children in the out-of-home care system, uh, people living in public and social housing tenancies, Madam Speaker, and every other vulnerable person who sits within his area of portfolio responsibility. And then, of course, we had um, a question from... Um, the ABC, uh, Edith Bevan on uh, ABC Mornings. Can I ask, why did you tell Parliament you weren't aware of any changes proposed or undertaken regarding changing the tenancy, state's tenancy laws so people living in rentals could be evicted without genuine or just cause? Mr Yench says, because the government has made no decision about changing the law. And therefore, when Ms O'Connor asked me whether a decision has been made to change the law, the answer is no. Madam Speaker, that's a brazen lie. You can't devolve into past, future and present tense 
and whip around language to try to get away from the fact that you lied to Parliament by lying again to a statewide radio audience, how can a Minister of the Crown say no decision because the government has made no decision about changing the law? The government did make a decision, Madam Deputy Speaker. It 100% did make a decision before the pandemic and it reversed that decision on the 24th of August, which means that for five months of a pandemic emergency, it was government policy to change the law to make it easier to evict tenants, yep. Madam Speaker. And then the follow-up question. Did you mislead Parliament? Well, anyone who's rational and had a look at the debate knows that the answer to that question is yes. Mr Yench says to ABC listeners, no, I did not mislead the Parliament. Cabinet deliberates on complex matters, sometimes at great length, going backwards and forwards over them before authorising that amendments or changes to laws be drafted for the purpose of consultation and then approved for tabling in Parliament. Now, that process hasn't happened on the matters Ms O'Connor raised and therefore no decision has been made to change the law. Well, one of the problems with lies, as my mother always told me, is that if you keep lying to back in a lie, you'll dig yourself into a very, very big hole, Madam Deputy Speaker, and that is what this minister has done. Because once he refused to correct the record on the first lie, and once the Premier came in and defended him on that lie, then objectively, uh, government members and the minister felt they had no other choice but to embark on a continued lie to the people of Tasmania, Madam Speaker. It's a really, um, it's actually for someone who um, loves the Westminster system of Parliament very dearly, Madam Deputy Speaker, and is a bit old fashioned about um, all of us trying to uphold its um, finest ideals. This is a depressing scenario that we're in because we had um, clear evidence of a minister not being truthful in this place, breaching the parliamentary code of conduct, breaching the ministerial code of conduct, being dishonest to the people of Tasmania, and yet there's no apparent consequences for it. You know, not only are we apparently in the post-truth era, Madam Deputy Speaker, we're in the post-consequence era where um, the government has decided the best course of action is to pretend the lie didn't happen, defend the minister, and carry on regardless, hoping it'll just go away. Well, it won't, because there's now a stink that hangs over this minister, and it'll hang over him all the way to the next election. Madam Speaker, you pay a price in this job if you're a Minister of the Crown and you lie to Parliament, so you should. The price you should pay is for you to resign or be sacked. That's what happened to Mr Combs. I've got the, the infamous Shreddergate letter here somewhere, um, which, um, here it is. Um, Minister Cons, as Attorney General, uh, denied uh, that he had um, made a decision relating to Mr Simon Cooper's appointment, um, lied again on the second question. Uh, both of those first questions were asked by my former colleague, Kim Booth. Uh, the third question was asked by um, uh, uh, current Senator uh, Nick McKim, uh, and it was on the third question when um, the shredded uh, and sticky taped document was produced that it was clear Steve Combs had knowingly lied to Parliament. And then Premier Paul Lennon um, basically said in shorthand, not that I was there or anyone in this place, as far as I know, mate, your position's untenable, you've got to go. And Steve Cons went. That's because Steve Cons had breached the Ministerial Code of Conduct. That's because, as a Minister of the Crown in the Westminster Parliament, Steve Cons had nowhere else to go. And his Premier understood that. Even Paul Lennon understood that when a minister lies to Parliament, they've got to go. They've got to resign or be sacked, Madam Speaker. We have had no humility uh, from the Minister or the Premier on this issue. Just lie after lie after lie. And this press conference that the Premier was part of on that same day, Madam Speaker, is a masterclass 
in the distortion of language. It is Orwellian, Madam Speaker, because the government had nowhere to go because the minister had clearly lied, what they decided to do was get into an exercise of past, present and future tense and replace the word was with has been. That's what happens when you have a look at the transcript because Emily Baker from the ABC asked the question about Mr Yench. Is he lying or incompetent? Well, the Greens would argue um, prima facie both. Uh, but the Premier says... Well, the question was in terms of whether or not the government made a decision to change the law, and no decision has been made by Cabinet to change the law. Madam Deputy Speaker, a decision was made by Cabinet to change the law, and then that decision to change the law was reversed. You've got a Premier of this state so blatantly misrepresenting the facts and twisting language. Further on, no decision has been made by the government to change the law. Yes, but Madam Speaker, it was. Further on, Cabinet has not made that decision. Yes, it did, Madam Deputy Speaker. Yes, it most certainly did. And then it reversed that decision on the 24th of August, and we know that because the Cabinet decision is here. How can a Premier stand there at a press conference and say no decision has been made when it's been made and then reversed, Madam Speaker. Further on, it goes, we haven't made a decision to introduce legislation to Parliament, but they did previously, Madam Speaker. No decision's been made by the government to change the law, he says, after Alexander Humphreys asked him a question. Um, Emily Baker comes back, Premier, with respect, trying to get some clarity. Mr Gutwin goes, I made that clear today and with respect again, I'm not going to get into the process of Cabinet deliberations, etc., etc., other than to say Mr Yench was correct and there has been no decision to introduce legislation to change the law. Further on, at the end of the day, the government has not made a decision to change the law, he said. Madam Deputy Speaker, this is shameful. If my children had lied so blatant to me, blatantly to me like this, I'd have sent them to their bedroom, Madam Speaker. The government did make that decision and then reversed it, Madam Speaker. Further on, no decision's been made to introduce that legislation. But then, because the journalists kept asking the question, the language changed subtly because the Premier knew he was in a corner, Madam Deputy Speaker, and he says, there has been no final decision. <laughs> if and when there is, we will obviously introduce legislation. We'll stand behind that. But the Cabinet has not made a decision to do that as yet. Further on, in this case, Cabinet has not made a final decision, Madam Speaker. So the emphasis has changed from there being allegedly no decision, which we know there was, to there being no final decision. Madam Deputy Speaker. Further on, Cabinet haven't considered final legislation on that particular matter. Now, this is the closest we get uh, in that uh, press conference to the Premier admitting that a decision had been made, because towards the end of the exchange uh, with journalists, he says Cabinet haven't considered final decision on this particular matter. And then just before the end, in terms of this decision, so we know there's been a decision now, so the Premier's confirmed it. In terms of the matter you talked about, Cabinet deliberates about a range of matters, but no final decision has been made, and he closes with, uh, until a decision is made on the legislation and whether to introduce it or not, no final decision has been made. Well, there you go, um, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, on that day, we had a Minister lie to Parliament once, twice, three times uh, on his feet, uh, in this place, and we had a Premier, at best, distort the truth 16 times in 16 different answers to questions at that press conference. How far we have fallen, Madam Deputy Speaker, when it is apparently acceptable not only for a Minister to be untruthful about a matter that relates to the lives of thousands of Tasmanians, but then we have the Premier backing him in and reinforcing that untruth and then the next day, 
the same day that Mr Yench tried to flee from cameras uh, in Launceston, we had a conga line of Liberal ministers saying they were backing Mr Yench to the hilt. So what had happened here is that government had dug some trenches and barricaded itself in behind them, sticking together and hoping that the fallout wouldn't hit them. And because they hadn't had the courage to allow a no-confidence debate on that last sitting day, for two and a half weeks there's been this miasma of dishonesty hanging over this minister and every government member who's attached themselves to him. Madam Speaker. And that won't go away because there's a culture we're talking about here. This is sort of, this is the inevitable consequence of a culture that began back when Will Hodgman was Premier, Madam Speaker, Deputy Speaker, back in 2014, when spin, propaganda, outright lies, like when Minister Groom uh, got up at the lectern here and told an outright lie to Parliament. We're not answering questions in this place, um, fobbing off questions at the estimates table, misleading Tasmanians through uh, journalists and press conferences. When that sort of thing becomes the culture of a government, then a member of that government, a member of that cabinet, understands somewhere inside that it's OK to lie because you'll be protected. It's a cultural issue. Madam Deputy Speaker. And regrettably for this Premier, who has done an outstanding job of keeping Tasmanians safe and earned significant respect in the community for that, this Premier hasn't upheld a high standard of integrity for his ministers and, in fact, has dragged himself down into the muck with a minister who lied to Parliament, Madam Speaker. So this is on the Premier more than anything else, Madam Speaker, because what he should have said to Mr Yench that day is, look, mate, I know that we were all part of that decision and I know that you were trying to protect us all from being exposed for weakening tenancy protections. But you've got to understand, mate, um, your position's untenable. You've been busted lying. Just go and sit up the back bench for a while um, and, you know, in a little while, maybe you can come back. I've got some other interesting projects for you. But no, we didn't have that, Madam Deputy Speaker. We had wholehearted, unflinching support for a lying minister, Madam Deputy Speaker. And so what happened um, uh, following... Uh, following that um, terrible day was that um, I got a quite an amazing letter from uh, the Premier, which is here somewhere. Oh, that's right. And so sometimes, Madam Speaker, when people are cornered and angry, they lash out and they're not completely um, rational and maybe not thinking things through. The first sign of that was the government not allowing the no-confidence debate. But the second most obvious sign was the letter uh, that I received from the Premier on the Saturday morning. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, it might have been late on the Friday. It was, it's dated the 25th of September. And this extraordinary letter from the Premier uh, seeks to blame the Greens uh, for um, a staff member's uh, suffering, a blameless staff member, and let's face it, every one of us here who has worked in an office has made a mistake in the past, Madam Speaker, and they are just mistakes. Uh, this is, this is, uh, there is no blame to be attached to that staff member, but what the Premier tried to do was make us apologise to the staff member in the Minister's office, Madam Deputy Speaker. And again, what arrogance. Instead of understanding that if Mr Yench had told the truth, that Cabinet decision would not have seen the light of day, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, the Premier tried to put the blame on us. And that is a feature of the Conservative mindset, Madam Deputy Speaker. It is always, always somebody else's fault. That's just the way they roll, Madam Speaker. It is always 
somebody else's fault. And then um, the Premier um, tries to accuse us of not upholding the principles of the Code of Conduct for members of the Parliament of Tasmania. And he very selectively quotes, um, a member mu must not use official information which is not in the public domain or information obtained in confidence in the course of their official duties or position for the advantage or benefit of themselves or another person. And I'll just pause there for a moment, Madam Deputy Speaker. We uh, had those Cabinet documents for more than a week and we thought very carefully and talked um, to each other um, very thoughtfully about how we would respond to having those documents. And as a former Cabinet Minister, I was particularly hesitant and cautious, um, Madam Deputy Speaker. <laughs> but what it came down to was the fact that a decision had been made that would expose thousands of Tasmanians on low incomes and living in rental properties, whether it's in the public or private rental market, it would have exposed them Honourable to members, risk. Time's expired. We yeah, have no Premier. confidence in Minister Yench. He is a brazen and knowing liar.